This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. We have been on a bit of a hiatus, but we are back. We're going to be doing uh, shows on a number of books in the coming weeks and months, including a multi-part show that we're going to work our way through human action with a couple different scholars. And I think you're really going to enjoy that, especially if you have not had an opportunity to tackle that book already. Our show might make it easier for you. Uh, But this week, we are happy to be joined for the first time by our great friend uh, in New Orleans at Loyola, Dr. Walter Block. And we haven't spoken to him on the show before, so Walter, it is great to hear from you. Thanks for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure. And of course, I'm allowed to call him Walter, but the rest of you can call him Dr. Block, (laughs) as it goes. Uh, Now, as I mentioned to you off air Dr. Block. Uh, Our subject is Henry Hazlitt, and we want to talk a little bit about his great book, Economics in One Lesson, which, of course, uh, he is perhaps most widely known for, but he had absolutely prolific career otherwise. Uh, By way of background, people, anyone listening to the show who has not yet read Economics in One Lesson, you need to rush out and get it. We have a copy available at the Mises Institute. Uh, Unfortunately, we do not own the copyright to this book. It is owned by a major publishing house who's, who shall go unnamed for purposes of this show. But we have paid them to print our own version of it. There are PDFs out there online illicitly floating around. Uh, we sell a, an inexpensive paperback copy. But also, as I hope many of you know, we are re-releasing another hardback Mises Institute copy later this fall. We had a great fundraising uh, kick for it. We're going to be using this book as a giveaway. We are not going to include it uh, for sale as inventory in our bookstore. We are going to give it away uh, due to an excellent arrangement with uh, a particular house. We were able to get our costs down for a very nice hardcover uh, down below $2. So it's going to be an absolutely great tool as a giveaway. And, And as I mentioned, if anybody hasn't read it, I mean, really, this is one of the very first economics books I ever read. I had the good fortune to stumble across it in undergraduate uh, 25, 28 years ago. Um, It's a very, very, very well-written and straightforward book. It's really Hazlitt at his best. It is comprised of very short chapters, each of which tackle a particular issue, for example, rent control, minimum wage, etc. And what's so beautiful about it is other than a couple of introductory chapters about the big lessons, the big picture in economics, uh, the rest of the chapters really read well as standalones, even if someone hasn't read it chronologically. So you could give them to a friend or family member and say, hey, read the chapter about rent control. Uh, So it is a, a fantastic book. Uh, came out in 1946. Hazlitt was born at the end of the 1800s. Uh, we'll get into some of his bio here in a bit with Dr. Block, but it was written in 1946, which was actually a time where, although we don't think of it this way, uh, you know, it was actually a very tough time in academia, uh, you know, during World War II in America. And a lot of academia was still enthralled to communism. It saw uh, socialism as inevitable and scientific. And the 30s and 40s were not particularly good eras uh, for free market thinking in the West or, or in the U.S. in particular. But in 44, uh, Hayek releases The Road to Serfdom, which Henry has it reviewed for the New York Times. Uh, and also in 44, Mises releases Omnipotent, Omnipotent Government and Bureaucracy. And then just a couple years later, Hazlitt releases his own book. So uh, it's a really fantastic read. You have to read it. You have to get it. You have to own this book. It's not good enough to just have this book uh, via PDF or an ebook or something. This is one of those books. This is one of those five or ten that you have to own physically. And we're going to make it available to you free because we want to get this book out of there. We're going to get about 50,000 of these books uh, this fall and make a, a huge campaign with it. So with all that as background, uh, Walter, I want to start out by saying you, know, you wrote an introduction to this book for a version the Mises Institute released about 10 years ago, and I think you wrote it in 2007. So tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, before I do that, I'm a professor. I'm never supposed to answer direct questions. I want to attack you for damning this book with faint praise, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> your your um, economists toward this book were pathetic. Uh, this is a magnificent book, and, and Jeff um, uh, underestimated the importance of it. I'm, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, <laughs> The uh, I was uh, privileged to uh, do an interview about the book, um, and uh, it came out as a forward of the book, uh, and I'm just uh, delighted uh, with the book. It's um, my own two books, Defending the Undefendable 1 and 2, was sort of modeled after it, what they both have in common. It, when I say what they both have in common, it sort of reminds me of the joke, there's an elephant and a mouse. And the uh, elephant and the mouse go over a bridge and they make the bridge sway. And the mouse says, well, we made the bridge sway. Well, <laughs> on the mouse, Henry Hazlitt is the elephant. Uh, Henry uh, Hazlitt, uh, th this book is, is terrific. It's the best introduction to economics. And I was uh, privileged and honored to um, uh, do an interview on it, which became a forward to it. And what I said was that uh, my own books were an homage to this, what they have in common is uh, they each offer a general principle and then know 30, uh, 35 different uh, instances of it. And in the case of Henry Hazlitt, what he said is, when we look at economic issues, let's not just look at um, uh, the immediate effects on some people, but rather let's look at the long-term effects also on all people. And then he gave 30, 35 instances of it, uh, among which are free trade, minimum wage, uh, uh, rent control, and, and uh, just uh, uh, three dozen other instances of it. Uh, so I, I um, emphasized the, the generality of it and also the particularity of it, namely the generality of these two major principles of economics, namely looking at uh, uh, any given public policy or economic law or an enactment, uh, not just for one or a few people, but for everyone, and not just for right now, but what's going to happen next day, next week, next month, next year. So uh, I, I can't uh, say enough about this book. It is a magnificent book. And of course, he's borrowing that concept in part from Bastiat's uh, concept of the seen and the unseen. Why, why do you think we still struggle with that so much today? People can look at, let's say, a government-funded housing complex and say, well, Jeff, uh, the federal government took some taxpayer money and built these houses, and they weren't there before, and now some people live in them. They have homes. Maybe they didn't have homes before. That's very tangible. That's a good thing, Jeff. Why don't you support that? Right. And uh, you're certainly right that, uh, look, we all stand on the shoulders of other people who came before us without any exception. Even Mises and Rothbard stood on the shoulders of people who came before them. And, and you can't say too much about Mises and Rothbard. And certainly uh, Henry Hazlitt stood on the shoulders of Bastiat with the seen and the unseen. And this is one of the main reasons why it's so difficult to um, espouse and convince people of the merits of the free enterprise system because they see uh, a government housing project and it's new and it's gleaming. They don't see it 10 years later when it's got rats in it and has to be knocked down like pruitt Igo houses in St. Louis. They don't see that. They see the new house. But what they don't see, the unseen, is all the things that could have been built uh, had had those uh, public housing projects not been built. They don't see the toasters and the air conditioners and the shoes and, uh, and maybe the airplanes and the boats or whatever. Uh, they don't see that. All they do is they see what the government gave them. And, you know, people, uh, what's that expression? Who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Well, of course, your, your eyes will see the... Um, uh, see the public housing, or they see the bridge, or the tunnel, or whatever the the public library that the government built, and they say, "What they do? Government is great. Look, look what they just did. Isn't that nice?" And um, it's easy to see things with your own lying eyes. I'm kidding about lying eyes. With your own eyes, you can see it. Whereas you never see or even think with, without the uh, help of Henry Hazlitt about the other things that could have been built. So it's not a question of, isn't public housing great? Isn't a public library or, or an, a university great? It, the question is, which is greater? The thing that the government did or the thing that we would have done had we been free to do whatever we wanted to do? And the assumption that the government is better is that they know best how to spend our money in our behalf which is a little silly because most people, most people uh, 
realize when push comes to shove that uh, they know their own best interests a lot better than someone in um, uh, Washington, D.C. does, and they, they'd just be happy to spend their own money the way they want it, uh, spend it maybe on a rowboat or, uh, or a house or whatever it is instead of um, uh, a public work. And, of course, when he talks about looking at the effects of a particular policy uh, over the long run on everyone, he's also tangentially introducing, I think, the idea of time preference. Oh, yes, certainly uh, time preference is, is, is crucially important. Um, the idea here is that we all have a, a certain rate of time preference. Some people are uh, look for immediate gratification right away, and other people have a much longer uh, time horizon. And uh, we should each, uh, and I'm not saying that a long uh, time horizon is better than a short-run immediate one. I'm just saying it's sort of like vanilla versus chocolate ice cream. They gustibus non disputandum. In taste, there is no disputing. Uh, so if people are impatient for immediate gratification and the government builds a long-term uh, highway or a bridge or a tunnel or whatever, uh, their time preferences will not be taken into account. On the other hand, if the government gives uh, breakfast for kids uh, in school, which is an immediate uh, benefit, uh, what about people who have a longer-term preference? Uh, they can't be met. So in the market, everyone's uh, desires can be met because uh, the market caters to everyone. But when we pool our money through government and forget about the fact that, you know, for every dollar we send to Washington, we get, I don't know, 10, 20 cents worth out of them uh, because most of it goes um, uh, is wasteful in transfers and in um, uh, people lining politicians' pockets. I just heard that Obama bought a $15 million house. And if you look at all of the income that he made, uh, uh, and it was, he was always on, on the government uh, payroll, uh, a $15 million house is hard to justify. And, and also, if you ask, well, which are the richest counties in, in the U.S.? I think seven or eight out of 10 of the richest counties are all clustered around Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of money that uh, gets left in Washington, D.C. when people all over the country send money there and then the money comes back. Well, a lot of it doesn't come back. So uh, I think whether it's in terms of time preference or in terms of just desires for goods, um, uh, government expenditure is a disaster. And Henry Hazlitt, better than pretty much anyone else, points that out. But put on your hazard cap for a moment. What do you think he'd say today? In other words, some of these fallacies that he just absolutely demolishes in such plain language in this book, the broken window fallacy, the seen and the unseen narrative, uh, you know, they, we still struggle with these. Even as libertarians, we struggle to explain these things today. So what's, what's the blocky and Hazlitt uh, uh, antidote to this? That's a vicious, underhanded question, Jeff. <laughs> you're, a, <laughs> you're a nasty man. <laughs> How do we fix this, though? How do we fix these errors in the public's perception? Well, you know, I hate to be uh, negative and I hate to be uh, pessimistic, but one of my recent articles is uh, on why it is that we have so much trouble in uh, convincing people why it is that St. Ron Paul, a lot of people think he's just a doctor. I've promoted him to a saint. Why St. Ron Paul gets 1% of the vote when he runs on the libertarian ticket and why uh, he uh, didn't make president uh, candidate uh, for the Republican Party when he ran for that. Uh, and, you know, why are so few people libertarian when libertarian is, you know, clearly just and leads to prosperity? And my answer is, and this is the case for pessimism, that it's biological. We are hardwired not to appreciate markets because markets are only, oh, I don't know, uh, 10,000 years old, uh, maybe 20,000 years old, where we've had uh, markets and people exchanging stuff. Whereas our um, uh, need for and desire for uh, either benevolence or a leader is um, uh, deep, much more deeply embedded uh, for many, many more eons, maybe uh, all the way back to our mammalian stages. When I get freshman economic students and I tell them about um, uh, Katrina uh, and and the um, uh, uh, price gouging that occurred after that, you know, they're instinctively, viscerally appalled and disgusted that anyone would raise prices when other people needed stuff. And I think that's biologically determined that, um, uh, you know, we have a, a strong benevolence uh, hardwiring. 
if you're sick this week and we're a million years ago in the caves or the trees and I help you this week and next week I'm sick, you help me, our tribe survives. Whereas if uh, we don't, if we don't have a, a strong uh, sense of benevolence, uh, the, the whole tribe uh, fails and, and, and we are descended from people who, who lived and left progeny. So my answer to the question of why Hazlitt, brilliant as he is, and all the Hazlittians, uh, and I certainly include you and me and all the people associated with the Mises Institute, why are we uh, not doing any better? Why will this podcast be heard by, oh, I don't know, five or 10,000 people? Why not by uh, 50 million or, or, or a billion people? Well, I think it's hardwiring. Uh, that we are like rocking, what is it, not rocking, uh, rolling the uh, rock of Sisyphus up and up the mountain and it keeps rolling back. Why is it? Biology. Does this mean we shouldn't try? No, you and I have devoted our lives to trying. And I can't, for myself, and I'm sure I speak for you in this, can't imagine any other life uh, other than one of promoting liberty and good economics. But uh, you know, we don't. We want to be accurate. We want to uh, tell the truth, and and I think uh, part of the truth is that the reason we're not more successful is uh, biologically uh, based, not determined, but biologically based. We are inclined uh, in that direction. You and I, Jeff, are mutants. We are mutants. Not that we started no, out um, uh, uh, favoring free enterprise, but that we were at least open to it. Uh, whereas a lot of people are not open to it. You, you tell them stuff uh, of the Hazlitt uh, variety, uh, the broken window fallacy, and, and they call you a fascist or, or, or something like that. You know, uh, so closed are they to it. And a lot of people are like that. And I'm talking about decent people who, if they see you uh, 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 choking, uh, they'll give you a Heimlich maneuver. If they see you uh, suffering, they'll, they'll give you private charity. These are decent people. But when it comes to uh, push comes to shove about economics, they are literally closed. So that would be my very pessimistic answer to your uh, nasty, vicious question. Mm, well, so you heard it, heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, libertarians are just more highly evolved. Right. And that's why we believe in this. But to your to your earlier part about tribes and cohesion and trust, which was probably baked into our DNA as a matter of survival, uh, I would say that w as societies advance beyond tribes, uh, that markets are in fact the social cohesion, that markets are the benevolent force that bring us together in cooperative ways. So, uh, you know, it really is an interesting question. But Hazlitt didn't ignore this, by the way, as, as, as uh, plain spoken as he is in his book. He also wrote, uh, for example, an essay on the task confronting libertarians. He wrote this later in the 1960s, which, uh, which we'll link to online, which is very interesting. Uh, Walter, I wanted to ask a little bit or discuss a little bit his style. He, this is a journalist. And th this is a guy who is able to take a uh, complex or even opaque economic theory and and put it forth very plainly in a lively style with great prose that makes you want to read it, that's not boring, that's short. Almost all of his books are just a, a few hundred pages. And I was thinking to myself, who writes like this today in economic circles? I mean, to an extent you do because you write a lot of books for popular audiences and you're very prolific. Uh, I think Bill Anderson, a lot of readers of Mises.org will recognize William Anderson. He's a prophet Frostburg State. Uh, who is a journalist before? He's a really uh, a superb writer. Uh, you know who's who, who might be a, a modern Hazlitt, Walter? I mean, we've got people like John Tamney who writes for Forbes and Real Clear Market. Uh, Gene Epstein uh, w was a very clear libertarian writer who wrote for Barons for and edited for Barons for a long, long time. And I believe he might have written for Forbes as well. Uh, is anybody come to mind as as uh, uh, you know approaching uh, a modern day Hazlitt? Well, I would say a lot of the people who write for uh, Mises dot org and also for the um, um, uh, LouRockwell dot com uh, fit this bill. And and uh, among the people there, I would add Tom Woods and uh, Lawrence Vance, uh, Tom DiLorenzo. Um, uh, especially Tom Woods. I think he's one of our best writers and certainly one of our best uh, public speakers. Uh, so we do have uh, people who are uh, 
literate and and brilliant writers and brilliant speakers and and if and talk about making opaque and and uh, difficult uh, concepts uh, clear. I, I think you have to mention those people. I I think it was H. L. Mencken, another uh, person who could really write well, who once said that. Who I think it was Mencken uh, who said of Hazlitt, the man could really write, or uh, he he said that he was a brilliant writer. Uh, so, but you know, uh, I wouldn't say it's scarcer than his teeth. And Jeff, I would include you as well. You you are a very very good clear writer. And I think a lot of the people associated with the Mises uh, Institute or with LouRockwell.com uh, fit that bill of of being beautiful writers. Uh, so happily, we've got some good people. Ron Paul, also uh, uh, Andrew Napolitano. Uh, you know, I, I've got the um, uh, the screen uh, of uh, LouRockwell.com right on my screen, and you know, you just sort of look down the list of people that he uh, picks for Lou Rock, and Lou Rockwell himself, obviously, is a is a brilliant mm-hmm. writer. So we do have very very good writers in the Hazlitt mold. Maybe not as good as Hazlitt, but you know. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to be uh, as good as the best, and Hazlitt was really uh, one of the top people, just as a, a clear writer. Yeah, and while you're mentioning LRC, let me also throw out Butler Schaefer as someone who I think is just such a, a superb writer. Of course, we don't have Macon. Uh, we've got his writings. We don't have Joe Sobern anymore, who had a, a particular gift. But I just want for our listeners, I want to read a quick list of the outlets for which Henry Hazlitt wrote in his career. And and when I say that career, let me give you some stats that Bettina Bien Graves compiled. He wrote about 15 books, thousands and thousands of articles. Uh, she estimates his total output at about 10 million words. So maybe that's not approaching Rothbard, but I'll tell you what, it's up there. Uh, he wrote for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Evening Post, the New York Evening Mail, the New York Herald, the Sun, the Nation, uh, H.L. Mencken's American Mercury, the New York Times, of course, Newsweek for many, many years. And then, of course, uh, the Freeman, which was uh, the, the magazine newsletter that, that Fee put out for many years. And he finished out uh, as a columnist uh, with the L.A. Times syndicate. So what, what a career. I mean, this guy's a writer and a journalist first and foremost. And it's just so rare, Walter, that, that we get writers and journalists in our camp. Yes. Look, I, as I said, I've got Lou Rockwell right on my screen, and I'm just going to read today's contributors, all of whom are really good writers. Otherwise, Lou wouldn't have them included. So who do we have? David Stockman, Gary Barnett, Paul Gottfried, excellent writer, Philip Girardi, Pat Buchanan. Now, I don't agree with Pat Buchanan on everything, certainly not on free trade, but he's a great writer. Whitney Webb, uh, Arjun Walia, Michael Krieger, Israel Shamir. Wait, I got to push down. Uh, Charles U. Smith, Victor Marcioni. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the problem with naming names is you're always going to forget someone. If I looked a day before or two days before on LouRockwell.com, I'd get another uh, 10 or 12 people who are just brilliant writers. Now, you know, David Gordon, you don't think of him as a journalist. You think of him as, I don't know, a genius. But he's a good writer, too. He's an excellent writer. He's very funny. He's very uh, amiable. Well, <laughs> not all that amiable always. Uh, he he uh, sticks, uh, sticks the shiv in, uh, in people brilliantly and, and uh, witting uh, very, uh, in a very witty way. Uh, so, you know, the, the problem with naming names like this is you're going to leave out another um, uh, three dozen people who also ought to be included. But uh, the Mises Institute and LouRockwell.com are blessed by having uh, people who are not, and I'm not talking about substance now, we're not talking about substance, you just asked about, you know, writing style. Uh, They have beautiful writing styles, and I recommend these two. Uh, I read them every day, I I wake up in the morning, and then uh, sometimes I work late at night, and I can read the next morning stuff the night before, so I I can't say enough about these two uh, websites. One thing is very interesting about Hazlitt, uh, unlike a lot of libertarians, he really focused on inflation. Uh, in, as a matter of fact, uh, he lists in the essay on strategy I mentioned earlier that the inflation issue is the most important. And if libertarians could win on that, they would indirectly win on all others. And uh, a lot of his work during his years at Newsweek were about inflation and about money. And th- those were assembled together 
in a book entitled 1960, What You Should Know About Inflation. Again, that's uh, comprised of many of his Newsweek articles. So, uh, you know, talk about that. Talk about the importance of Hazlitt to the American public's understanding of money and inflation. Well, I think you've touched on a very important point. I mean, you know, uh, there's always the risk of uh, the diamond's water fallacy or the diamond's water, uh, uh, well, fallacy. You know, uh, why is it that diamonds are um, uh, so valuable and, and water is not? And yet if all diamonds disappeared tomorrow, we'd live life pretty much as, as now. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, but uh, she could deal with emeralds or rubies. Whereas if we got rid of all water, uh, life would end in a matter of um, days or even hours. Uh, so you don't want to make, I guess what we're now going to do is engage in the diamonds water fallacy. And the obvious answer to that is marginalism. You know, uh, all of water versus all of diamonds, we pick all of water, but this little cup full of water versus this little cup full of, uh, of diamonds, we're going to pick diamonds. Uh, so the the issue is, uh, which is more important? Is it inflation or, I mean, there are other industries like uh, steel. The steel industry is important. Um, uh, the uh, energy industry is important. The educational industry is important. So if you look at uh, things from the uh, uh, non-marginal, but the total, uh, even then, I would say inflation wins out and, and money wins out because as important as um, steel and, and energy and oil and uh, education and other industries are, money uh, in, is involved in every uh, transaction, uh, including all those industries plus every other industry. The only time money is not involved is in barter and uh, or maybe gifts. And now uh, we don't... Uh, uh, you know, we don't have much barter. We have gifts, but we don't have much barter. So money is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and I, I would say that, um, you know, he, uh, Henry Hazlitt has been instrumental in, in pointing out the inflation, uh, pointing out the evils of the Fed. I mean, if you look, the Fed started in 1913, roughly 100 years ago, give or take. And if you look at the 100 years before 1913 and the 100 years a little bit plus after uh, 1913, uh, you know, the inflation with the Fed is way worse than before the Fed. And not only that, but the business cycle theory and uh, the business cycle is, you know, uh, great amplitudes uh, before and uh, rather after the uh, Fed in 1913 and not so much before. Uh, Hazlitt also wrote a book, uh, The Fallacy of um, um, what is it, Keynesianism? That was one of his longer books. It, it's uh, like a, a line by line or paragraph by paragraph, evisceration of uh, Keynes' book in 1936, The General Theory. And uh, Hazlitt is uh, just uh, nothing short of magnificent in, in pointing out that, that inflation is a, a very bad thing and uh, that um, uh, it impoverishes people and the business cycle theory makes us less prosperous than it otherwise would be. Uh, to just give you an illustration of how important this is, according to some theories, the reason we had Nazism, the rise of uh, Nazism, was uh, because of uh, uh, World War I. At the end of World War I, we had the Treaty of Versailles, which blamed Germany for, for the whole shooting mess. And then uh, we had the, uh, the um, uh, hyperinflation of 1923. And uh, which is traceable to uh, the Treaty of Versailles, which is obviously traceable to World War One. Well, the hyperinflation of 1923, when people were carrying the uh, uh, German currency around in wheelbarrows to buy a loaf of bread, led to the rise of Hitler. At least uh, this is a plausible theory. I, I'm not a historian enough to know whether it's true or not, but it's certainly plausible. So this gives an indication that inflation is um, uh, deleterious, not only in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, nowadays it costs more than uh, earlier days, but, you know, in, in creating a monster uh, such as Hitler. Uh, getting back to just ordinary uh, difficulties of inflation, when I was a kid, I was born in 1941, you could buy a hot dog and, and a can of Coke or a bottle of Coke or uh, Coca-Cola for, I don't know, 15 cents. Now uh, it's, um, I don't know, <laughs> it's a lot more. You could buy a gallon of gas for uh, 20 cents. Now it's uh, 10 times as much. Uh, according to uh, more exact figures, the Fed has... Um, uh, 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 been responsible for the uh, leaching out of the dollar of something like 96 or 97 cents. Namely, uh, a dollar now is only worth four cents of it what of what it was when the Fed started. Uh, 
And Henry Hazlitt has been uh, foremost among uh, all economists. You call him a journalist. I call him an economist, too. Yes, he had no credentials, but by gum and by golly, there are a lot of people with PhDs in economics uh, uh, who shouldn't have them. I mean, we have recalls for cars. We should have recalls for PhDs. Uh, Hazlitt didn't have a PhD, but as far as I'm concerned, he was an economist and a journalist, and he did more than pretty much anyone else on the planet uh, to point out the evils and the horrors of inflation. Well, and, and let's go a little deeper there. Not only did he not have a PhD, this was an entirely self-taught guy. He had to drop out of school at a young age to support his mother. Uh, he was interrupted in his schooling later by being sent off to World War I for about a year. Uh, he came back and, like a lot of young people, was struggling with how he might make a living uh, without any uh, formal education. And he found out that secretaries were making more than some uh, labor positions were, some uh, physical labor jobs. So he ultimately became a secretary, I think about $15 a week at the Wall Street Journal. And that was how he began reading and writing and editing. Uh, and then, of course, economics came later. But as you as you mentioned, this is an economist. This is a self-taught guy. I mean, anybody who tackles Keynes's general theory line by line is an economist by any measure of the word. Oh, absolutely. Let me tell you uh, how I first came to know of Henry Hazlitt, if I might. Uh, I was a uh, senior in college, Brooklyn College, and Ayn Rand was invited by the Ayn Rand Study Club to give a speech at um, Brooklyn College, and there must have been 2,000 kids in the audience. And I came to boo and hiss her because everyone knew she favored free enterprise, and everyone also knew that uh, you know free enterprise meant uh, starvation and, and uh, evil and exploitation. I was a, um, a fellow student with Bernie Sanders. We were both on the track team together, and my views then were roughly his views. So I came to Boo and His Ayn Rand, and um, uh, at the end of her lecture, uh, they announced that there was this Ayn Rand study club lunch in her honor, and anyone could come, even if you disagreed. And I wanted to show her that socialism was the way to go. So I came to the room, and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of the table, and near her were uh, Leonard Peikoff and uh, Alan Greenspan and uh, Nathaniel Brandon and all of her buddies. And there must have been 50 people on the side of a long, thin table, and I was relegated to the foot of the table. And I sat down, and I turned to my buddy there, my next-door neighbor, and I said, you know, socialism the way to go. Capitalism is evil. And he said, well, you know, I don't really know all that much about it, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. So I went and I stuck my head between um, Nathaniel's and Ein's. I was maybe 20 years old, Brandon maybe 35, Rand maybe 50. They were the adults. I was a kid. And I said, you know, there's someone here who wants to debate someone on hmm. socialism and capitalism. And I said, who? And I said, me. I was chutzpahnik in those days. Still am a little bit. And Brandon was very, very nice. He said, look, there's no room at this end of the table, but I'll come to the other end of the table and talk to you about this on two conditions. One, you promise not to let this conversation lapse, but we continue until we settle it. And two, you'll read two books that I recommend. And we talked, and I came to his house and Ayn Rand's house. And um, guess what the two books were? Well, one of them was Atlas Shrugged, which I regard as the best novel ever written. And the other was Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Uh, so that's how I got into it. Uh, that book, uh, plus the discussions with them, uh, converted me to minarchism. I was now a sort of, not an Ayn Rand cultist, but, you know, I, I agreed with uh, minarchism, uh, uh, roughly, um, you know, a free enterprise, um, maybe armies, courts, and police for the government, but that's about it. And then just to continue this uh, discussion a little bit more, sure. uh, I met Larry Moss, who was a student, of, a fellow student of mine in Columbia, and he and his roommate, Jerry Wallows, ganged up on me, and they said, you have to meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. And I said, no, 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 Murray Rothbard's an anarchist. Anarchists are evil. But finally, they, they got me there, and I met Murray, and uh, Murray converted me to uh, free market anarchism in about 10 minutes, guess how, using economics in one lesson, Henry Hazlitt's uh, insights. Namely, what Murray said is, look, you know, you uh, learned from Henry Hazlitt that uh, uh, we should privatize the post office and, you know, we should privatize roads and we should privatize education. Well, why not armies, courts and police too? also? And, you know, Murray he, he sort of was uh, not a karate guy, but a, a judo guy. He used my momentum against me and tossed me over his shoulder into anarcho-capitalism. And he used the same 
economics in one lesson, Henry Hazlitt insights, Murray did, to show that it should apply also to armies, courts, and buoys. And if it applies to those things, well, then we're anarchists. So I sort of owe Henry Hazlitt um, uh, my present views uh, with, with a little, with a lot of help, or a little help uh, from Murray. One other anecdote: I, uh, uh, my son Matthew, when I was trying to uh, convert him to the one true faith, I used economics in one lesson by Henry Hazlitt, and Matthew wrote a letter to Henry Hazlitt. And Matthew is maybe ten or twelve years old, and Henry Hazlitt was kind enough to write a letter back to Matthew. And I kicked myself for uh, having lost that letter. And I, uh, I asked Matthew if he had it, and he didn't have it either. I, that letter is probably worth a, a lot of money now, uh, a letter from uh, Henry Hazlitt to my son, age 10 or 12 or whatever. It's just another indication of what kind of a guy Henry Hazlitt was to write a letter back to some kid who wrote a, a nice note to him about his book. Well, for our audience who are not familiar, uh, you know, not only was Hazlitt a self-made guy, if you talk to Lou Rockwell, you'll find out that he was uh, almost a self-made aristocrat. In other words, this is a, a man who came from very modest background in, in born in Philadelphia, but lived most of his life in New York. Uh, and not, you know, not only his uh, learnedness, but his speech, his bearing, his dress, his mannerisms uh, were very aristocratic. People may not know that he lived a very long life all the way until 1993 when he died at the age of 98. He was actually one of the first board members of the Mises Institute, along with Lou Rockwell and along with uh, Margaret von Mises, Mises' his widow. And people, in addition, might not know that Henry Hazlitt left us some money in his estate, which helped build our original building in 1997 when the Institute completely broke away from Auburn University uh, across the street. So uh, I guess if you want to say that this uh, podcast is uh, overly fatuous towards uh, Henry Hazlitt, you you can say, well, that's just because he gave the Mises Institute some money uh, when he died in 1993. I guess you can say that if you wish. But uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know Hazlitt's background with Lou Rockwell and with the Institute itself. Now, Walter, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, did you have an opportunity to meet Hazlitt when he was still alive? Yes, I certainly did. I think I was even a speaker at the Mises Institute that dinner in his honor when he was 70 or 80. I forget when it was exactly. I think it was his 70th birthday. His 70th birthday was in New York City, and I think I was one of the speakers then. I'm not sure, but I was certainly there, and I uh, shook his hand and said hello to him and, uh, you know, sort of reveled in his presence. Uh, uh, He he was just a great man, and, you know, I regard what you just said as... um, uh, uh, I think uh, underappreciative of him, uh, what you said as well, people will say, well, the only reason we like him is because uh, he gave the Mises Institute money. Uh, I would look at it, I, I certainly think that that's true. Uh, no, <laughs> that's false, sorry. I don't think the only reason we like him is because he gave the Mises Institute money. But the way I see it is he gave the Mises Institute his imprimatur. Uh, he uh, he put his money where his mouth is. I didn't even know he gave um, money to Mises Institute. I knew he was a fan and a supporter. Uh, but the fact that he gave money uh, to the Mises Institute shows something something uh, glorious uh, for the Mises Institute, that a man of uh, uh, Hazlitt's stature would uh, single out the I don't know what single out, but would support the Mises Institute uh, is uh, certainly a big feather in the cap of the Mises Institute. Well, and of course, again, his, his main profession or his paid profession was journalist. How many journalists uh, amass the financial wherewithal to leave money to organizations like ours, significant money, seven-figure money, to an organization like ours at their death? It's really a testament to uh, not only his uh, acumen, but his work ethic. I mean, this was a very, very hardworking guy and, again, prolific. And and uh, people may not know that you know he, he involved himself in debates. He appeared on TV uh, not infrequently. He even debated uh, vice president. Uh, Henry uh, candidates, uh, you know, this was a guy who, you know, today, even though there are far more mediums available to us, uh, media available to us, uh, libertarians often struggle to break across into uh, larger forums. You know, 30, 30, 40 years ago, you wanted to be on, uh, you know, talk to Walter Cronkite. Today, maybe you want to talk to Joe Rogan or whatever it might be. But nonetheless, uh, we still continue in our in our time as in Hazlitt. We struggle to get our message out. But this is a guy uh, who was writing for and appearing in very mainstream outlets. So uh, for, for that alone, I think 
he deserves more credit as a libertarian leading light, as a superstar of our movement, as an originator of our movement, as someone who ought to be discussed uh, in the same breath as an Ayn Rand or a Murray Rothbard, because his influence was really that great. Uh, Now, I would be again remiss if I didn't turn to at least one point of contention, however small, perhaps between the Walter Block worldview and the Henry Hazlitt worldview, and that's uh, in the area of ethics and all of its permutations. He's, you know, again, a guy who was really, really knowledgeable and wrote on a lot of things beyond just economics, but he wrote a very interesting book in 1964. It was released called The Foundations of Morality. And uh, this is his ethics book. He goes into the idea of what's proper for society. He uh, determines that because there are differing opinions on religion, no ethicist uh, uh, is able to say uh, what particularly re- religious view ought to ought to hold for all ethical worldviews, but instead he says we ought to determine what's rational and what's beneficial for humankind. And so basically he arrives at a form very similar to Mises's uh, rule utilitarianism. In other words, his utilitarianism, Mises' utilitarianism, is different from that of uh, of a John Stuart Mill or a Jeremy Bentham, uh, but it's more uh, means and ends related. And so. He was he was not a natural law guy. In fact, in that same book, he criticizes natural law at a few different points. He says, well, part of its appeal is that nobody really understands exactly what it is. And so, uh, you know, I, I was hoping to get your thoughts on this, Walter, because I know this is something where you are very much a Rothbardian. You're not a consequentialist, and you're someone who believes in a uh, a normative ethical support for a libertarian worldview rather than a utilitarian. Uh, support for a libertarian or a laissez-faire worldview. So that's that's a lot. That's a mouthful. But give us your thoughts. Okay. Well, thanks. I, I think that that's a very intriguing and interesting point. Uh, look, when, when you're, um, I, I'm not a, a supporter of Mises and Hazlitt on on utilitarianism, but you know. When you attack Mises and and Hazlitt, uh, you know you better uh, you better be careful because uh, they are uh, eminent people in, in terms of ideology and uh, intelligence, uh, and uh, you know they're two of the great minds of of Western civilization of any year. Uh, I'm sort of a moderate on this. Um, as I think Murray was, it's not that we're against utilitarianism, broadly speaking. It's just that uh, uh, when push comes to shove, if we're forced to distinguish between um, uh, deontology and utilitarianism, we go deontology. Deontology is rights, uh, and utilitarianism, broadly speaking, is um, uh, happiness or benefit or utility. Uh, where we, where if I can speak for Murray on this, um, where we uh, agree with utilitarianism is that the free enterprise system is broadly based, uh, uh, conducive to human happiness. Uh, so if we follow the non-aggression principle, which is sort of the basis uh, of uh, uh, Rothbardian libertarian um, deontology, the the um, uh, non-aggression principle, of the law of free association, uh, private property rights based on homesteading, uh, we will come up with a situation which, broadly speaking, is is very utilitarian. Uh, namely, it brings about prosperity and the greatest happiness for the most people. Uh, where we diverge is that it is possible, maybe not practically, but at least theoretically, to say, well, look, suppose we kill innocent person Joe, and um, uh, all of cancer will be cured, uh, and we'll all live forever, or something like that. Well, should we do it? Well, you know, the utilitarian might be very tempted and say, well, yeah, it's tough on old Joe, but we got to kill him. Uh, because uh, the benefits of uh, no more cancer, you know, will uh, kill many, many more people than just Joe. Whereas the deontologist says, look, you know, <laughs> uh, the non-aggression principle, we're serious about the non-aggression principle, and we don't kill Joe no matter what. Uh, innocent Joe. I mean, if Joe is guilty in self-defense, we can kill him. But uh, an innocent person, you don't kill him for whatever reason. So here we have some sort of... Um, uh, bifurcation or diversion between the two views, but this is very theoretical uh, and, and very uh, hypothetical. You know, killing Joe and and you know we get rid of cancer. I just uh, I concocted that uh, not originally, but uh, you know this is a total concoction. But if we forget about those sorts of things, 
we can make not only a deontological uh, rights-based case in favor of free enterprise, but also a utilitarian one. For Look, right now, uh, I'm sitting at a desk, and um, uh, uh, let's say I bought this desk for um, $200. Well, if I bought the desk for $200, how much did I value it at? I had to value it at more than 200 otherwise I wouldn't have bought it for 200 If I only valued $1.50, uh, $150, and I bought it for 200 I'd lose 50 So let's say I valued it at 250 So I made a profit of 50 bucks off the deal. Well, how much did the guy who sold me the desk for 200 value the desk at? Probably 10 bucks because he had 10,000 of them, and he wanted to get rid of them. And he had them all in his inventory. He wanted to push them. So he made a profit of um, uh, 250 minus 10 or 240 uh, now, the way the Marxists would say it is, well, we each <laughs> exploited the other, but that's, you know, silly. Uh, the way a rational person would look at it is, as you said before, the market is a way of cooperating with each other. We each made a profit off of the deal, off of each other. Namely, we cooperated with each other and we uh, bettered our situation. As Mises would say, human action is the attempt to make the future a better situation for us than it would otherwise be had we not done what it is that we just did. And I bought a desk for 250 and, and uh, or 200, and I valued it at 250, and and the seller uh, sold it to me for uh, 250 and valued it at 10. So there was mutual benefit. Well, the free enterprise cons system consists of nothing else but voluntary interactions of that sort. Yes, there's buying and selling. There's renting, there's lending, there's gift giving, but all the free enterprise system is is uh, 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 mutual agreeable exchanges of that sort, and each one necessarily in the ex ante sense uh, benefits and is mutually beneficial. Uh, ex post, maybe I regretted it, uh, buying it because you know uh, it's splintering or something, and maybe the seller regretted it because there's gold in that desk and he didn't realize it. But uh, you know, you buy shirts or shoes or uh, eyeglasses or air conditioning, you, you necessarily benefit ex ante, which means that you improve human welfare ex ante and usually ex post as well. So here's where the, um, uh, uh, the aspect of utilitarianism comes in with deontology, namely if you stick to the non-aggression principle and private property rights and free association, you're left with laissez-faire capitalism. And laissez-faire capitalism necessarily, ex ante, uh, improves human welfare. So if you want to improve human welfare, which is what the utilitarians want, uh, well, then you have to favor laissez-faire capitalism, maybe for different reasons, uh, not because of adherence to the principles, but because of uh, human um, uh, betterment. Uh, uh, but you, but the, the two are not that far apart is what I'm trying to say. The big mystery is how any utilitarian could be against the free enterprise system, and yet uh, many critics of the market are utilitarians. You know, Bernie Sanders and, and all the people running for the Democratic uh, nomination, they, they think they're utilitarians. They think that what they're going to do is uh, for the human betterment. It's just that they're, uh, they're wrong. Well, although he never, to my knowledge, directly addressed at any length Rothbard's uh, ethics of liberty in the 70s, he was, of course, uh, someone who knew Rothbard and, and who, on a couple different occasions, praised Rothbard's work. I want to close with this. Uh, he did, in fact, take a look at Robert Nozick's uh, book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which is in the same general era as Rothbard's work on ethics. And uh, we'll... we'll uh, post a link to that essay, uh, along with the other one I mentioned. This essay is called The Case for the Minimal State, and it gives a good, concise uh, view of Hazlitt's very respectful and mild criticisms of natural law and some of their proponents. But, uh, Walter, I want to close with this. You know, he was the kind of guy who helped friends. Uh, he not only helped the Mises Institute, he was a personal close friend of Ludwig von Mises. He, for the New York Times uh, book review, reviewed uh, Mises's great classic socialism favorably, quite favorably, and was uh, surprised only about a year later or so to receive a call from Mises himself saying, hello, this is Mises. And he later said it was like getting a call from John Stuart Mill or something like that. That's what it, it, it stunned him at the time. And of course, the first thing he did when Mises arrived in New York was to begin trying to help him obtain contacts, uh, get his name out there and earn money. And one of the things he did to, to that latter end is he got him a, a brief gig for a couple of years writing editorials for the New York 
York Times. And uh, Mises was paid the whopping sum of $10 per editorial for, for that work. But more importantly, far more importantly, is it helped get Mises' name out there in America. And of course, less than 10 years later, he would produce in English, by the way, not his first language, uh, the magnum opus human action. So that, that was the kind of guy Hazlitt was. He didn't only, he wasn't only self-made, but he helped to make other men as well. So Walter, I, I, you have helped make a lot of young people, uh, great Austrian scholars. You've helped a lot of people uh, understand the world better. You've helped a lot of people get jobs. You've helped a lot of people get educated. And I was so happy today to discuss Hazlitt with you. Uh, let me just add one more vignette uh, along the lines that you mentioned. Uh, Henry has at one time had a regular column for Newsweek. And when he left, uh, he was supplanted by three people, uh, Milton Friedman, Paul Samuels, and I forget who else it was. And Milton Friedman, uh, who I'm not a big fan of, but uh, I'm a fan of his, uh, said something nice about Henry Hazlitt. He said it took three of us to replace him. So that was a, a very nice uh, statement by Milton Friedman about Henry Hazlitt. And I, I want to add that to the mix as well. Well, uh, Walter Block, thank you so much for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, go to Mises.org, find out about our upcoming edition, new edition of Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. If you care to donate to that project, we've been very happy, thrilled with the fundraising on that so far. If you care to donate, uh, I believe $500 or more, uh, you will get your name in, in, in the plate in the front of that book along with other names. But uh, even if you don't care to donate, uh, you know, be sure to follow the project and get yourself some free copies of the book when it comes out. Thanks again, Walter. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org. Mises.org.